California is in the middle of a burning crisis. It threatens our lives. It threatens the air we breathe. It also threatens our way of life. Many of the deadliest fires are caused by our electric grid. The nation's largest electric utility, PG&E, went into bankruptcy because of fires it caused. Beyond health and safety, this crisis is about whether the lights come on for tens of millions of people. No matter what, it won't be cheap. This is going to cost all of us. Even if you don't live on PG&E's turf, even if you don't live in California, the crisis can seem too big and complicated to grasp, but it really does smolder down to just three basic elements. Fire, power, money. We'll give each element its own episode in this series. My name's Brandon Riddiman. As a journalist, I've covered countless wildfires. I've been certified as a wildland firefighter, and I've got more than a decade of experience covering politics. I'm here to take you through every part of this mess so all of us can understand it, not just the insiders. This is Fire, Power, Money, California's burning crisis and how it's going to cost us all. Fire. Without harnessing its magic, human civilization wouldn't exist. We use it every day to cook our food, to heat our homes, to travel the world. We're good at controlling fire, but we are not its master. Fire is nature, part of a cycle that used to clean up California's forests on its own. But humans broke the cycle. We put out every fire we could for more than a century. As a result, we've got a hundred years of extra fuel lying around ready to burn. It's made some fires so big, we can't stop them. Fire is the most basic element of this story. We'll either learn to live with fire or keep getting burned. This is paradise. What's left of it? About 40,000 people used to live up here on the ridge. Half a year later, almost all of them are gone. Hardly any of the buildings survived. The flames of the campfire killed 85 people, making it the single deadliest wildfire in California history. It was a wake-up call, something we hadn't seen before. A lot of the attention ended up here on Camp Creek Road, about eight miles away from Paradise, the road that gave the Camp Fire its name. State fire investigators say that is what started it, the Caribou Palermo transmission line, a high tension power line owned by the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. We are gonna shine a big old light on PG&E, the crimes it committed and the money it's gonna cost us. But before we do that, you need to understand that not every part of this problem is their fault. The sparks may have come from PG&E's power line, but they fell into a world that's ready to burn in ways we're just not used to. Climate change is giving us more bad weather for fire, but that's only part of the story. California's forests and wildlands aren't healthy. We made them that way. The modern California megafire is a human creation a century and a half in the making. When we talk about wildfires, we almost always talk about the huge number of acres they burn. Hundreds of thousands of acres burn each year, which sounds bad, but it's not the problem. Should we be paying less attention to the acres and more attention to how it's burning? That's a great question, and the answer is absolutely yes. Hugh Safford is a world expert on forests, working out of his research lab at UC Davis. He's also the U.S. Forest Service ecologist for the entire state of California. If we try to reduce the number of acres that burn each year, he says our crisis will only get worse. Really, the issue is we need more fire in a lot of these forests than we have currently, not less, but it has to be the right kind of fire. The 
the right kind of fire does exist. It doesn't look like nuclear Armageddon. It just cleans up the forest floor. This is Yosemite National Park, where rangers try not to fight fire. They treat fire as part of nature because that's what it is. Fire crews watch this fire to make sure it's not going to burn people or property, but they try to let it burn as many acres as possible. Almost all of the big trees survive this kind of fire, and they thrive afterward. The fire burns away smaller plants that compete for the same water and nutrients in the soil as the big trees do. And even more important, when the next fire comes, there will be less fuel here, and those big trees will have a better chance of survival. Burning the right way makes the forest safer, and nature will do it on its own, but only if we give it time and space to happen. It's been more than four decades of this pro-fire policy in Yosemite, and fires are consistently less extreme now. Outside the park, though, it's the opposite story. Fires that people are, uh, are accustomed to, that have experience with today in California, are almost invariably large, destructive, headline-grabbing events that burn homes and kill people. The fact is, many of our forests are too overgrown to handle a natural fire anymore. We have grown up really seeing forest that is not in a healthy state. Californians are used to seeing forests that look like this, a wall of green so thick you can't see through it. Firefighters have a name for this thicket of plants, ladder fuels. Because the plants all touch each other, flames can quickly climb them from the forest floor all the way up to the treetops. This particular forest is so overgrown, it's hiding something from you. This is an entire neighborhood. From this angle, you are looking at hundreds of houses right now. The forest is simply too thick for you to see them, unless you look straight down. Tree branches touch almost all of the houses and power lines here. People living in these kinds of neighborhoods enjoy the greenery and the privacy that that overgrown forest gives them, but on a dry day with bad wind, there'd be no hope of saving this community from a fire. Could we lose another whole town again? Uh, unfortunately, yes, we, we could. There, there are... Um, places throughout California that you could see with a large uh, fire that's coming in uh, under certain circumstances, it could enter and, and wipe out town. Turns out we know a lot about how fires got this way. Scientists can see evidence in the tree rings. Here's the general story we see all across California forests. I think John Muir wouldn't even recognize today's forest. I just don't know how he would. Let's wind back the clock on California's forests all the way back to the early 1800s. Before settlers got here, our forests were dominated by very big pines. In general, we had much bigger trees and a lot fewer of them. And the forest burned a lot thanks to lightning strikes and native people. Most of the fires were really mild back then because it burned so much. Pines thrive in this mellower kind of fire because it burns away other species like firs, which can't handle fire as well. Then in 1848, everything changed. The gold rush brought hundreds of thousands of settlers to California. They killed and ran off almost all of the native people. They cut down the biggest trees for lumber and when they saw those mellow fires, they put them out. With no fire to burn them away, firs and cedars and brush all filled in the space. The crowding stressed the trees, making them more vulnerable to bark beetles, which added dead trees to this bonfire. All the while, people moved into this landscape, falling in love with the views of the trees. This forest that used to burn every 10 years or so hasn't burned in a century. It's got 10 cycles of fuel sitting there waiting to burn. If it gets a spark on a windy day, then all bets are off. This is how mega fires were born.
The combination of overgrown forests and climate change creating more dry, hot, windy days is already redefining our idea of just how bad wildfires can be. In 2017, the entire city neighborhood of Coffee Park burned down in Santa Rosa, one of many we lost in a cluster of fires that broke out in wine country. 2018 gave us this, the Redding Fire Tornado. Measuring an EF3, you're looking at the strongest rated tornado ever recorded in California, and it was made of flames. The fire tornado killed people, including Redding firefighter Jeremy Stoke, who'd cut his own vacation short to come back to work to save people. His pickup truck landed here, 60 paces away from the road he was driving on when the tornado hit him. Just a few months later, the campfire claimed even more lives when it burned down the entire town of Paradise. I don't, I don't know if it's... The dark made it hard to see. The wind made it hard to hear. What's the closest thing to this you've seen? Car fire? Car and camp. Two fires that burned to new extremes. They had different causes. The car fire started because of a flat tire. It wouldn't blow up into the monster it became until the wind picked up, days later. But like one out of every 10 wildfires in California, the power grid started the campfire. And there's reason to be especially concerned when wind damage meets power lines. I want to show you a moment you rarely get to see in real life. The moment a power grid sparks a fire. The vast majority of those fires start on distribution lines. That's industry talk for these, the power lines in your neighborhood, usually up on wooden poles. The fire hazard mainly comes from trees growing too close. You get a big windstorm and it blows part of the tree into the line. Sparks shower down onto the ground below and now you've got a fire up and running with the wind. Some version of this is what was behind most of the fires blamed on PG&E in 2017. And it shows you why the law requires power companies to keep trees trimmed back. Simply put, power lines are more likely to start a fire during the kind of weather that's most dangerous, bad wind. But this sort of thing doesn't tend to happen on the kind of power line where the campfire started. On that day, PG&E says it had a problem with a transmission line. We're talking about these big steel towers that carry high voltage over huge distances. Usually when you get bad wind, these lines should be safe because they're taller than the trees. But on that day, the wind may have exposed a different problem. PG&E says it had a weak link. An old hook was worn down and it appears to have broken in the wind. That may have allowed part of the line to swing free and hit the tower, showering the brush below in molten metal. Worse, it happened on a steep hill that was really hard to reach. By the time fire crews showed up, there was no stopping it. When the fire got to the hilltop, it started to shower all of paradise in embers. Go, 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 go. Oh my God, the tree's burning right next to us. All those homes I gone. I feel the heat now. It's on fire. And we're stuck in the middle of it. And these trees can come down at any moment. Trees were falling in the road. Propane tanks were exploding around us. Um, buildings were on fire. Robin Souza and her family ran for their lives. It was chaos. She drove out, picking up strangers in her car. Like, did you have a moment where you didn't think you were going to make it out? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was, um, I was ready and prepared. For? To meet my maker. <laughs> I was ready, yeah. It was like, this is it. She and her family survived. But far too many people didn't. 85 people died in the campfire. Some people couldn't escape on their own. Paradise had a large population of elderly and disabled people, and some just couldn't evacuate themselves. But we also found problems with the effort to warn people. I just wish I had done something different. I think about it every day. 
wishing I could just, you know, reverse it all and do something different. Christina Taft chose to run for her life that morning, but she couldn't get her mom, Vicky, to leave the house with her. Christina says they were fighting about it when they split up. Her mom didn't think the fire would be that bad, and nobody told them to evacuate yet. She didn't want to die, and I knew it was bad. She didn't realize it was going to be bad. She was hiding in her house. I had said she'd probably be alive now. Like two-thirds of the people killed in this fire, they found Vicky's remains in her house. Vicky Taft died in her living room while her home and her neighborhood all burned around her. The fire was so destructive, it took two weeks and a DNA test to identify her remains. Christina thinks an evacuation order would have convinced her mom to go with her. And that hurts, because it turns out there was an evacuation order, issued two hours before Christina decided to make a run for it. The order didn't reach a lot of people who needed it. So you got no phone call? No. You got no alert on your cell phone? No. No one knocked on your door? No. You can argue that people shouldn't need to be told to evacuate, but that's not what the official plan was. The exact words they printed on the evacuation plan given out to people here were, if you are not within the immediate hazard area and not directed to evacuate by public officials, remain at your location and shelter in place. A lot of people probably figured they could shelter in place because there was never a concept of everything burning. Town Councilman Mike Zuccalillo says in past fires, rescuers learned that the roads here jam up if everyone tries to leave at once. The idea was to have people wait for their zone to be called to evacuate the town a neighborhood or two at a time. So there wasn't a whole town evacuation plan. There was never a whole town evacuation plan. That meant when the order came to evacuate the whole town that morning, there was no plan to make that happen. A key life-saving tool went unused. The local police and sheriff's offices never activated the federal emergency alert system and its wireless counterpart, which would have sent warnings to everyone's cell phones, radios, and TVs. The sheriff himself was on the streets of Paradise helping evacuate people. He told us he didn't know if the idea of pushing out those alerts even occurred to anyone. Do you think that we need to take a second look at why we uh, and you know the broadcast alerts weren't implemented? Yeah, I think I think it's certainly worth uh, taking a look at. It, it was. Uh, we were working the plan that we had. Remember, that plan was designed to evacuate town piece by piece, not all at once. It might have worked really well if a fire was simply racing to the edge of town, but that's not what happened. The campfire started in this canyon, but when it got to the hilltops, extreme wind carried millions of embers through the air, dumping them all over the community of Paradise downwind. What began as a forest fire became something else, a town fire, what firefighters call a conflagration. The burning buildings made even more embers, lighting even more of them on fire. We captured it happening that day as Main Street businesses burned down around us. There's no one doing structure protection on these specific buildings. Fire crews are spread pretty thin right now. It's been hard for them to triage what building they can save, what building they can't. And in the meantime, as you can see behind me, there are all kinds of embers flying all over the place here. Those are landing in dry leaves, pine needles, eaves of buildings, and then new ones are going. Every time we drive down this main route, we see a new business on fire that wasn't the last time we drove by. This fire was nearly impossible to fight. The first day was mostly an escape and rescue mission, a traumatic one that those who escaped won't forget. You know, we're having to lean on each other more than we have in a long time, get each other through those, those bad days. Robin and her husband lost their house. Right now, they live in a trailer they bought and parked in a friend's side yard. They're down the hill from Paradise in Oroville. When they rebuild, they plan to make their new home down here. We can only do this so long.
Robin lived in this house up in Megalia, just outside of Paradise. Half a year after the fire, she doesn't even know when crews will haul the ruins of her home away. The state says it'll take more than a year to scrape up all the debris here. Even then, it's unclear when the water will be safe to drink again. The area still needs to rebuild businesses, its hospital, its schools. After seeing all the devastation and realizing it would be three, four years before the community was back at, to any degree, um, we decided to just um, cut our losses and, and move on. This fire didn't just kill people, it killed a community. No one that I know personally is rebuilding up there. Paradise needs more than a rebuild. It'll need a rebirth. No one ever came to us and said, you know what, you, you could have a town-wide evacuation and you could lose everything in town. No one ever told us that. The campfire showed us that it's just not good enough to plan for a bad fire. We need to plan for the worst possible fire, the perfect firestorm. It took just the right combination of wind, dryness, heat, and a spark in the exact worst spot. But it could repeat itself. It, it can happen. I mean, to date, this is the worst tragedy that's ever happened. I hope I'm the last person that says that. I hope there's not another town. The state is pushing cities and counties to update their plans, to think ahead of time about using those broadcast and wireless alerts if a fire grows worse than the plans were built for. The high death toll in Paradise sounded a new alarm. Fire scientists say it'll take decades to fix our forests. So that leaves us with a crucial question. How are we going to do a better job of surviving megafires in the meantime? This is an old school warning system, the air raid siren. Crude but effective, some communities do use them to warn people about wildfires. In the hills north of San Francisco, the city of Mill Valley installed these sirens after the Oakland Hills fire. That fire killed 25 people back in 1991, and until the campfire, it was Northern California's deadliest. This idea that you could just die in your house and never know you were under an evacuation order, yeah, that's what we want to eliminate. Yep. Mill Valley Councilwoman Sashi McEntee says the air raid sirens have a weakness. They only work if you teach everyone ahead of time what the alarm means. They need to know in advance what to do when they hear it. This is an evacuation drill notification. Not anymore. This thing is an LRAD, long range acoustic device. Designed for the military, this is a super specialized speaker optimized for sending warning tones and verbal messages over long distances so everyone can hear. The tone is loud enough to hear from inside the surrounding homes. You might have to go outside to hear the spoken words, but we could make out the message listening carefully from a half mile away. But this makes it extremely clear. The, if you hear a, a, a verbal message coming from the LRAD siren, it's extremely clear exactly what you need to do. The sound of this test surprised some folks who came down to see what was going on. There is no telling how many more people might have evacuated sooner if they'd have had something like this in paradise. Mill Valley is upgrading all five of its sirens to LRAD technology this year, complete with battery backups and satellite communication so they can work even if a fire burns the phone lines. Whatever the solutions, every community needs to plan now for the worst case fire. Because fixing our forests is a massive job that'll take a long time, but it can be done. On the drive into South Lake Tahoe from Highway 50, you can see what happens when we do the work and when we don't. It was a miracle no one died. I don't know how that happened. This big bald patch in the forest is the scar left by a fire 12 years ago, the Angora Fire. 
Started by an illegal campfire, this one also had extreme wind, loaded full of hot embers. Those embers could have destroyed the whole city of South Lake Tahoe, the same way we lost paradise. But South Lake caught a lucky break that morning. It took the embers and it sent, it out, sent, it, sent the long distance embers mostly out into the lake. If it had been a half a mile south, most of those embers would have landed at South Lake. And I think you would have had a very, very different outcome. The city of South Lake Tahoe was a half mile away from having what happened to paradise? Essentially, yeah. I mean, I, you know, you, you can't predict things uh, in hindsight that didn't happen, you know, but the conditions were there. The conditions were there, and that's what everyone was really worried about. 12 years after the Angora fire, and this is what it looks like on the ground. The forest simply isn't coming back. The flames were so intense and so hot, they destroyed the pine seeds here. That's why it left a scar so big, you can see it for miles. Megafires can convert whole landscapes from forest to brush. And it's not just bad for the scenery. Brush dries out faster than trees do, making it easier to start the next fire. Our worry is that once you create huge blocks like this, that you may have uh, essentially cast in stone, if you will, their future. But on the edge of this burn, part of the forest was saved. This part of the forest was thinned by three different cutting and burning projects in the 1990s and early 2000s. work mimics what nature used to do all on its own. Much like that right kind of fire we saw in Yosemite, the cutting and burning makes the forest floor cleaner. Neighbors didn't really like it much at the time, but they like it a lot now. That thinning work made the homes here feel less private and secluded, but the trees survived. The crews removed the overgrown fuel, so the fire was simply less intense right here. Today, the treated area has trees, the untreated areas don't. And it saved some homes. Some of these homes here burned down due to embers, didn't protect these. It protected dozens if not hundreds of homes further up line. But this was just a small fuel reduction project right on the edge of the houses. If we had treated the entire forest before it burned, we might still have a forest on Angora Ridge. And we might not have lost all 250 homes we did. If you wanted to speak statistics, the chances are that more homes would have made it. So if you thin the forest, you have fewer sources for embers. It's going to burn, guaranteed, right? The question is not really if, but when. So you can modify the outcome. This right here is living proof for the fact that some work ahead of time can actually modify the outcome. But it's been hard to get the money to do thinning work beyond small patches of forest right by homes and roads. And to this point in time, Congress hasn't seen fit to subsidize that work to any, you know, to any really great extent. Fire scientists do have a back of the napkin number for how much work we're talking. A million acres a year. That's about how much of California's forests used to burn in an average year before settlers came here and started putting every fire out. This isn't a new breakthrough. We knew this back in the days when Yosemite changed its policy. It's just been tough to get people to accept it. We've known since the early 70s that this long-term blanket policy, putting all the fires out at all times whenever we can, was, was going to come back and bite us. And I think, you know, we, we, we're over that threshold now. For all the fighting between California and the federal administration, both levels of government acknowledge the need to do more work to fix our forests. We're talking about a lot of work that looks pretty harsh while it's going on. Prescribed burns make a lot less smoke than megafires, but they're still not pleasant. And cutting is done thoughtfully with a plan to leave the big trees in place and keep a variety of vegetation for all the wildlife, but it still looks bad. It brings back memories of clear-cut logging. The rough target is a half million acres treated on federal land each year and a half million on state and private land. I think people haven't really gotten their minds around the idea though that we need to do a million acres of like literal landscaping work every year forever. Is that basically what we're in for? It really is. We, we, have, we have neglected forest management and, and uh, wildland health 
uh, for decades. The state government is about halfway to its goal, and incoming Governor Gavin Newsom did request more money for fuel thinning work in his first budget. It's an important part of the solution, but it's also going to take people hardening their homes to be less vulnerable to embers and flames, and some strong thinking about where and how we build houses near the forests in the future, because embers can fly through the air as far as a couple of miles. The longer we wait, the harder this is gonna be. It took decades to make this mess, and it'll take decades more to undo it. Our grandkids might be able to see some of that effect. Where they can just start maintaining instead of having a problem that's lying out there to fix. Yeah. We can't make California stop burning. It burned before settlers came here. What we can do is make more of the burning be the right kind of fire. Humans gave birth to the mega fire. We can choose to roll it back, but it'll take dedication from everyone involved, and it'll take a lot of time. PG&E was convicted of, a federal, of six federal felonies in 2016. After that, you took more than $200,000 to help get elected. How should people trust you to be running the show to come up with the solution? PG&E is a convicted felon. Next, this crisis takes us to San Francisco, home of the largest power monopoly in the nation. You just can't start a fight you can't win with PG&E. What happens when 16 million people have to buy power from a convicted federal felon? A felon who owns the power line blamed for starting California's deadliest wildfire. To determine whether or not there, this is a criminal negligence. If a person were convicted of 85 counts of involuntary manslaughter, would that person, that individual person, be in prison, yes. Uh, can you put PG&E, the entity, in prison? No. We'll cover PG&E for what it is, a convicted corporate criminal that holds massive power over the 16 million of us who need it, a felon who spends millions influencing our politics. 